as I was uh, saying on Friday night, uh, one of the reasons we've been able to meet so peaceably is uh, because of uh, the lawsuit for which uh, David Yeagley has been the plaintiff. Uh, he was not here when uh, I made those remarks, so I wanted to repeat them. And we, we very much appreciate his willingness to, as I say, uh, take up the white man's burden and lead the fight <laughs> against uh, the thugs and the rowdies that uh, shut us down. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you uh, David Yeagley. He is an enrolled member of the Comanche Nation of Oklahoma and lives in Oklahoma City. He holds a master's degree in divinity from Yale, a master of arts from Emory University, and he holds a doctorate in music from the University of Arizona. He has actually composed a symphony which uh, will be performed or has been performed shortly in Oklahoma. It's being recorded, yes. Uh, no, I've, I've heard uh, passages of it. It's uh, extremely pleasant, musical. It's, it's the real stuff. Uh, uh, he's been an American patriot uh, through public media since uh, 1987, and he worked with uh, Oklahoma Governor Frank Keating in 2000 to establish instruction in American patriotism for Oklahoma's public schools. He has been a columnist for Front Page Magazine and has appeared on many radio and television programs. He's published three books, and his articles have appeared uh, in all the places that you might expect. Uh, Brother Yegley has a unique American Indian point of view. Uh, as he pointed out, uh, I just, ju this just occurred to me, he and I were born on very close the same day. I was born 10 days after he was. And he calls me little brother. <laughs> but, uh, it's, uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you uh, Big Brother Yegley, who will speak on the dread or fear of whiteness. I think that um, it's very important to establish uh, off the bat, why in the world that I would go to bat for the white race, particularly the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant race, which was the very race that subjugated the American Indian. Uh, this strikes many people as uh, ironic, if not totally disingenuous, and they assume I'm some kind of private millionaire in the background and just having fun in, in life, entertaining myself and trying to cause trouble, um, and other things that rich, bored people do, um, like George Soros, um, <laughs> or for that matter, T, T. Boone's uh, Pickens. Um, I can't, I can't fully explain it because I operate on intuition um, and thereby events my primitive nature, my primitive side. Uh, my father was a, a kraut and my mother is Comanche. So uh, I'm, I'm destined for battle one way or the other. Uh, <laughs> um, it seems to me that a cultural train wreck as, uh, as was the American Indian count encounter with the white European, um, it is a tragedy from the Indian point of view, but I consider it a, a past event if you follow me there. That, that's over. What do we do now? Um, you, can't, you can't describe uh, a tragedy in a way that's uh, appealing, but you can reinterpret it so that it's meaningful and that, so that there is advantage in it, so that there is purpose in it. Um, 
And that's what I've tried to do. Um, and you have to be very honest uh, once you delve into these uh, racial realities. Um, the white race didn't do anything that Comanches didn't do. They just did it better on a larger scale. To this day, Comanches are known as the, the, the baddest, I mean, I, I could think of all kinds of foul terms here to, to, uh, which, which are used to refer to Comanches. Um, the bad guys, always the bad guys in everybody's minds. The, the Comanches are the, gonna, the people that are going to destroy you if you come near them. In fact, the name Comanche, they, they say, comes from a, uh, a Paiute word, Comats. Comats, uh, enemy. If you encounter those people, you're going to have a fight. That's just what, that's what they are. That's what they do. So avoid them. Um, interestingly, uh, Comanches, I think probably of all the Indians, are the ones that most closely um, follow the code of, uh, what did I say yesterday? They uh, uh, they de vici. They just appeared out of the southern Rockies from nowhere. I tell everybody we came from the wind. We're, we're not part of any other tribe. We came from the wind. We didn't come from the earth. We came from the wind. They came, they saw, and they conquered everything in sight and created the largest hunting empire on the continent. Drove out every other Indian tribe, including the Apache, which the Spanish were unsuccessful in driving out of Texas for 300 years. Comanches had them out in about six months, no, probably a little longer than that. Um, but very quickly. Um, so the idea that your race is the only race, that's, uh, Comanches took that to the extreme. Nobody else counts. We don't want, any, don't want any part of any other people. We don't need them. They're not part of us. This is solipsism in the extreme. Um, so how can I turn around and, and, and uh, criticize another race that just had better weapons, more numbers, and was doing the same thing? I mean, it, to all appearances, it was, uh, the white race was doing the same thing. Uh, real warriors admire other warriors. People of strength honor strength. Um, so I don't have any, uh, I don't have any hard feelings about that. You know, I, I don't want to identify with the, with the professional I call them professional belly acres. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say, but uh, <laughs> that's what they're doing. They're getting paid to do it. They, the, the, the left or the liberals or the, uh, the racial good deed doers out there, uh, you know, hired up a bunch of Indians from the North Country and paid them to hate America, hate everything about it. Uh, and protest the mascots, and it started back in the late 60s. Um, go for the big media targets, you know, protest the Washington Redskins, Redskins, protest the Cleveland Indians. And they did this sort of thing. And they set a precedent of the Indian image, which in 10 years I have not been successful in erasing. Somebody used the word erasure in their speech uh, yesterday. I, I have not been able to erase the image of the professional complainer, the, the, the uh, perpetually malcontent, the discontent, discontented. I've tried every angle I can think of that this, this, is, this is a horrible way to start out life, raising up your young people as, as uh, victims teaching them victimhood from the, from the time that they're born. And, and the, the liberals knew that uh, the Indians could carry that 
louder and longer than any other people here. You know, uh, that slavery thing, although they make a lot of uh, hay out of that, um, that was an import. You know, the black people are Im imported. Whatever wrong was done to them uh, is in a different realm than uh, the native who has moved off of his homeland. That's, that's the unique thing about, about the Indian. Um, but I find that uh, we still have a little piece of that homeland. And um, I compare the white race and its treatment of those whom it conquered to Mao Zedong, to even Adolf or Stalin. Of course, those are members of the white race, but uh, uh, they didn't leave anybody standing. People they didn't like, they got rid of. And I tell my friends, my Indian friends, uh, look, um, the white Anglo-Saxon sector of the white race is uh, pretty unique in my mind because not only were we left standing, but we were given uh, land allotments. You know, I, uh, now either the, the, the wasp is a uniquely noble uh, breed or else the Congress ran out of money. You know, those Indian wars were awfully expensive and better settle, you know. Um, I, I, maybe it's a little bit of both, but um, I think that um, a positive approach to life for Indians or for any people is the, is the best way to go. And if you start out with the idea that you are hopelessly inhibited uh, and that you basically opt to be a ghost dancer and believe in the past and that's all that interests you and that's all you want, that's all you care about and it's forever gone, uh, you are a ghost dancer. And I just don't think that that's the healthiest approach to life. As long as you're alive, you've, you've got to have options. And I say that to white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, you know, don't, don't, don't become a ghost dancer. You know, if, if your country is, is changing into something you don't want to see, if you find yourself being herded into some kind of socioeconomic status that, uh, where you're imprisoned, uh, uh, don't just give up and, and be a ghost dancer and wish that you were, uh, the times were uh, like they used to be. Don't do that. Uh, or you're becoming an Indian. That's what's happening to you. You're becoming white Indians. Um, and that is especially heartbreaking to uh, proud Indian people to see their conqueror uh, just sort of melt into nothing, uh, giving away the very property, the very real estate that he fought Indians over. You know, a lot of blood was spilled over this. This is a bloody path, the building of America. And um, to turn around and give that away to, give it away to Muslims. What is this? You can't, you can't do that. I, I won't let you do that. I will, I will join you. I will sue your enemies for you. Uh, I, Otherwise, you're killing me. I, I, can't, I can't see this. I can't, I can't see this happening. So uh, I, I've been very, very uh, encouraged by uh, uh, these, these uh, speeches that I, I've heard. I, um, I, oh, gee, I, I don't want to be guilty of uh, contradicting the, uh, the elite, uh, Mr. Uh, Guillaume Fave, uh, Fab. I, I don't see him. Uh, look, Comanches didn't become great by uniting with other Indians. You know, if you, if you follow my drift there, I mean, yes, there's white people all over, but the idea of white people being united, um, 
I don't know if that's if that's practical. I, I, I just don't know about that. Um, I know that people try to uh, put Indians all in the same basket, and uh, uh, Indians don't like that generally. You know, we had different languages, different religions. We lived in different territory. We had different lifestyles. We dressed differently. That's why we never united. That's why there is an America, because Indians can never unite. Never occurred to them to unite. Um, if that's a solution, um, that's long in coming. Uh, I, I'd say be more local about it. You know, uh, in America, we're going to have states' rights is the is is the path to take for our problems. I, th I believe states' rights. Um, America, uh, the Ameri the white Anglo-Saxon American Protestant is the ethnic group that created America. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the foundation of this country. You've got to build on top of that. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's just a fact that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're brave and, and proud, you don't mind acknowledging people that are stronger than you. You know, that, that there's a certain, a certain pride leads to a humility. If that's I can use uh, the ox, oxymoron there, uh, uh, proudly humble. Be proudly humble or humbly pride, <laughs> humbly proud. Because, uh, and I say that from a, coming from a people who were, who were defeated. Uh, what, what, you, what do you do next? Do you, do you, just, do you spend the rest of your life saying, uh, you cheated me? Or you owe me. You know, don't, don't fall into that. Uh, I mean, I don't mean to sound like uh, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche here, but uh, there's a certain honor and strength. And I tell everybody, just be strong. Be as strong as you can be. Because if you're not, whatever it is you have, somebody will take it from you. That's the law of the jungle or the prairie or where, wherever. Be strong. If it means outsmarting somebody, if it means outgunning somebody, uh, if, if you want what you have, if you value what you have, if you value what you are, be prepared to fight for it. I mean, this, this is absolutely heathenish talk here that I'm giving you, but that's, that's the way it is. Whatever you have, if you're not willing to fight for it, it will be taken from you. I taught my students that in the uh, University of uh, Oklahoma, um, Oklahoma State University, where I taught for six years. I got to the point where I was just saying very radical things, and I made trouble before I made tenure, so I'm not teaching at OSU anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've made a, uh, unfortunately for myself, I've made a lot of, uh, a lot of trouble, but, um, uh, I, I, I believe in what I'm saying, and uh, I, risk, I, I risk things to, to say them. And I think that people that, that, that do suffer from what they say, I think you consider it, you should consider it an honor, you know? Not a, not, it's not a complaint, it's an honor. You know, and then you can join the Indians around the camp and brag about your scars. Get jock, get jock, you know? Um, well, the, uh, the lawsuit, I, I know many people are, are, uh, are wondering just exactly what's happening. I'm, briefly, I'll say that uh, you have a conference. Um, I personally, I, I want to see blood. <laughs> I, I want to see more than a peaceful conference. Uh, I want to see people hung for their abuse of freedom, for their, for their lying, deceitful distortion of the most sacred uh, concepts that this country stands for. But uh, that may not happen. We may have to settle for, uh, for freedom of, of, uh, of speech rather than uh, the hangings of those who uh, work against it. Uh, but that's my aim, just, just, just so you know.
Okay. Um, now, we, with, with the, the protests, the internet protests that were launched against this, this very conference, uh, we may have some more uh, uh, targets, the people involved in trying to, uh, to discourage uh, the, the freedom of, of such a conference and the, the intense amount of libel that is on the internet, that is published. Did you know that you all are the most violent group in America? You aware of that? Wherever you go, you, you leave a trail of blood and violence. It's sure to follow. This is in print. This is in print on the internet. That's called libel. Uh, so we may have uh, uh, more uh, uh, opportunity to, for blood. <laughs> it, it's possible. And I use that term metaphorically, of course. Um, and I, I must say also that uh, this is, um, I do have a personal interest in this, you know. I, this isn't just a, uh, an act of, uh, what, what would we call this? Uh, bravura, or the part of an Indian without a, without a, a sufficient target to, to interest him. You know, I've got to go big time here. I've got to go on a, a national basis. No, I, I, say, I say that, uh, uh, I'm concerned about the Indian self concept, and I, I don't think solipsism is the way to go, although it is a dependable path, but it isn't, doesn't always have a dependable outcome. Um, I think that Indians should become more involved in the political arena of this country, and uh, um, take a sense of ownership of the country. After all, every chapter of this country is written by Indian wars. It, it, every step of development in this country is a result of encounters with American Indians. From the day the pilgrims arrived, from the day Jamestown was founded, until, uh, until the casinos. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I think that Indians, I tell Indians, look, uh, this is, America is your uh, adopted son. You raised him, you know. He, 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 he washed up on your shores in a, uh, he didn't know where he was, or uh, he knew what he was going to do, or what he wanted to do. But um, he needed a lot of help there in the beginning, and uh, the circumstances are such that every, for every inch he grew, it was by virtue of a relationship with some tribe around him. His polity, his survival, his self-conception, his strength. I mean, en enemies strengthen you. Enemies strengthen you. So that uh, I think that Indians could be very proud of our uh, uh, foster child turned into be the greatest nation in the world. Why can't, why can't you, I tell Indians, why can't you own that? Why can't you be part of that? Look, he's, 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 he's still printing your faces on his currency. You know, he's, he still loves to, to name his sports teams after, after your image. Uh, this is, and I don't think that this is, uh, uh, a pastime on the part of the, the white people of America. I think that they really feel a profound uh, pride in, in their relationship with Indians. Yeah, yeah it's a, it, was a, it was a victory, but everybody knows is, is by being outgunned and outmanned, but never mind, you know, if you're a warrior, you don't, you, don't, you don't argue about things like that. And the white man has this disposition to put the Indian in a, in a very deep psychological place in the uh, American consciousness, uh, the collective conscious, maybe even the collective unconscious. Uh, the Indian is the, the talisman of the country. The Indian is the warrior. And white people, the, 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 the white people that created this country, they were warriors too. Unbelievable warriors. 
I, for one, I, I'm not so sure I've been anxious to go up against the Comanches. You think about that. The, the, uh, but something about the, the, um, the moral uh, code that came with the white man, uh, he's not too anxious to, uh, to take that position of, of warrior as he once was. And I think that this is related to uh, fear, and I'm going to, that's the, the title of my talk here, and this is going to be a little bit uh, um, unexpected where, where I'm gonna go with this. Um, in the amount of time left. Um, it was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. Thus wrote Herman Melville in his famous 1850 novel, Moby Dick. In that chapter called The Whiteness of the Whale, Herman Melville, who was white, he was also Northern. He's also a liberal, as we will find out. Um, created this little artificial uh, diversity plant on the Pequot, where he put every kind of race and culture and language and religion on one boat that he could possibly cram. And they were all in the hot pursuit of the white whale. All right. Uh, he spends, a, in this one little chapter, I recommend everybody read it. It's called the, the Whiteness of the Whale. He observes how the color of white has uh, ensconced itself in all civilization, how it's used in art, how it's used in clothing. Uh, it's, it's an incredible poetic chapter, and he even mentions the white hoods of Ghent, England, he says white can be terrorizing, and especially if it's used as the color of something that is otherwise terrible in itself, such as a bear, or, a, or in this case, a whale. These, these monstrous creatures who are not white normally, if one comes out white, it's extra terror, uh, terrorizing. And then, of course, the white buffalo, which he doesn't mention. Uh, this is a more modern Indian thing. The buffalo is not normally white. If it comes out white, it's, it's, it's of spiritual portent. It is fantastic. So he examines the different kinds of, of uh, psychological functions of white and comes to the conclusion that uh, it is the most uh, horrible thing that there is uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, just sheer power. Uh, just, let me just read one, little, one more passage. Um, so dreadful is whiteness that all deified nature absolutely paints like the harlot whose allurements cover nothing but the carnal house within. And when we proceed further and consider that the mystical cosmetic which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light, forever remains white and colorless in itself, and if operating without medium upon matter, would touch all objects, even tulips and roses, with its own blank tinge. Pondering all this, the palsied universe lies before us a leper. And like willful travelers in Lapland who refuse to wear colored and coloring glasses upon their eyes, so the wretched infidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. Of all these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt? This is incredible. Okay, now that's a white man talking about whiteness. Uh, examine yourself on that. Uh, this, is, this is your personal uh, spiritual journey. How does white affect you? Now, 
we're in Tennessee, so I've got to refer to a southern literary figure uh, by the name of Edgar Allan Poe, a southern humorist hanging out occasionally in uh, Philadelphia. A southern humorist. He wrote a novel called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. It is about polar exploration, South Pole, 1838. When he gets down there, he finds, through shipwreck, he's marooned on this island, it's all black people on an island in the middle of the South Pole. And they receive uh, Arthur Gordon Pym and his companion, who happens to be an Indian, with all uh, subservience, all kindness, all uh, uh, goodness. I mean, I, I don't know wh how else to describe all of these terms. But uh, Edgar Allan Poe, as the author of this adventure, tells us that these are the most wretched, deceitful, violent savages on the face of the earth. And they're terrified of whiteness. And he, has, he makes up words to describe uh, the fear of whiteness in these people. And to make a long story short, um, the novel ends, they've got the chief of the blacks on this canoe and Arthur Gordon Pym and his Indian companion are going down this river uh, rather rapidly, and they come to a huge cataract, a, a gigantic waterfall, and in the middle of the waterfall is a gigantic figure in white. It's, he doesn't describe it other than that. It's just the whiteness was as the, the, the whiteness of the snow. Yeah, his, his skin was the perfect whiteness of the snow. And the chief is so terrified that he dies of a heart attack. He's dead on the boat before they even get to the, the figure. But they're going into this figure, and it ends there. It just ends in, in, in whiteness, the, the novel. Now, uh, Victor Hugo wrote a, a, uh, a sequel to this, which is not all that popular, but it's, it's the ice man or uh, the ice figure, and the, he takes it from there. Now, you've got two views of whiteness, one from a northern liberal and one from a southern, uh, I don't know, can we call Edgar Allan Poe a conservative? Uh, I don't know, I'm forever wary of that word now because of that speech about uh, cons conservative. I gotta, um, these speeches affect you, you know, if you listen to them, they affect your thinking. Um, but we've talking about fear of whiteness from the, from the, the northern side, from Herman Melville, the white man himself doesn't know what to do with whiteness. From the southern man, from Edgar Allan Poe, he puts the fear of whiteness in the darkies, to use an old British term for anybody that wasn't British, even if you're white. If you're not British, you're, <laughs> you're a darky. <laughs> um, talk about uh, solipsism. Um, but that's okay. Uh, I think the issue here is do, do white people fear whiteness? Is this something that is in the collective unconscious of the human race? Or is it just a, is it a uh, cumulative reaction of the white man to himself? Uh, that he fe that the white man feels in himself having conquered everything in sight. Is that why he's a little uh, unsettled about whiteness? Whiteness is a conquering force? I mean, that's the historical record. That's the track record of the white race. It is incredible. And as I said, as a Comanche, I can't, I gotta salute you for that. You just did, that's what Comanches did. Uh, how you how you create a moral justification of conquering um, that's your challenge I suppose uh, to 
to conquer other people, I mean, why do you do that? When I, when I used to teach humanities, uh, that's where I came up with the conclusion, you know, whatever you have, you better be willing to fight for it because if, you, if you're not willing to fight for it, somebody will take it, either on the basis of survival or on the basis of greed. And greed is basically fear of future survival. A greedy person is worried about the future. Uh, that's how I describe it. And so you, you accumulate things because you're afraid of not having them in the future. Um, I don't know. These are, these are heavy psychological terms. And <clears throat> speaking of psychology, I'll take one more deeper leap into it. And we'll go Freudian and we'll go Jungian about this. Uh, according to Freud, that's what the... Uh, that's what the libido is all about, is slaughter. And, and by virtue of your degree of sublimation of the libido, you are a civilized person. But the instinct is to... Uh, well, it, it isn't... There's it, something beyond murder. There's something beyond killing. What you're doing is consuming. And what consumption is, is actually unification of two separate bodies, they come together. This is the Freudian sexual theory and this is the Jungian sexual theory. It's the coming together of disparatous parts. And it's, that's the mystical version. I mean, we can, we can take this as far as you want to take it. You know, Scriabin, uh, the composer, Alexandrian Scriabin, wrote a piano sonata about a mystical experience where a man, he sees this beautiful star and he's in pursuit of the star and he comes closer and closer and closer to it until he consumes it and he becomes the star. This is mysticism. It's all, it's all about sex. I mean, you all knew that anyway. <laughs> but uh, there is the matter of survival and being intelligent about these things and managing the, the libido. Uh, management. It's all, success is always a matter of uh, management. Um, a Jamaican told me that one time. It's all about the management, man. Management. Um, I, th I, think I think there's a point to be said about that. And um, back to America, and I, I can speak to America, I, I can't, I don't really have the right to say too much about Europe, but uh, as an Indian, I think I'm, I, think I'm, uh, I have a right to speak about the, the American white uh, civilization. Um, according to our friend uh, Ann Coulter in her book called Treason, you know this one? This is one of her early ones. This is probably her best one, in my opinion. She repeatedly uh, refers to Harvard and Yale as the, uh, the offspring of the pilgrims, the blue bloods, and she identifies them as the traitors of white America. This is where liberalism comes from. Well, now, I, don't, I don't know that I have her blessing, but I will expand that uh, again into psychological theory that this, this is what I call the epidal complex. Uh, the white liberal is basically trying to destroy what the father's left. The, the white Oedipal liberal is hateful towards the father. He's trying to take over what the father left. This is the dynamic going on. It's like the, uh, uh, the son hates the father, uh, n not, not out of some homosexual theory, but because the father interfered with that beautiful mother that beautiful utopia that the mother provided for the infant. When the father comes along and interferes with that, the child has a natural resentment or competitiveness with the father, okay? Well, I'm looking historically applying that to the, the this, is, this is a field called psychohistory. I apply that to, to the behavior of the white race. The problem is the white race. The problem for the white race is just like Edgar Allan Poe and, and Herman Melville. The Civil War was over white people. It wasn't over black people. It was over white people that had different ideas of who's right and who's got the, the longest gun and the most men to, to declare who's right. That was about white people. Uh, I mean, I hate to, hate to uh, uh, pull the Negro off the stage there, but uh, he's really got a, a minor part. Uh, this, this is a white people's war. And my point is that 
uh, we, we all are trying to understand what's wrong. I mean, that, that's, what, that, that's what these speeches are about. That's what these movements are about. What's wrong? If the white race is, is imperiled, the question is why? What is actually happening? And there's various different theories. I, I've, I'm kind of heavy on the psychology there. Um, but uh, uh, it has to be, your, your understanding of what's wrong dictates what your solution is going to be. If you've got, a, if you've got a, a wrong understanding of the problem, then you're going to waste a lot of arrows, a lot of guns, a lot of bullets. Okay, look for a, look for a, at least, you know, we all have to live with ourselves, at least look for a solution that makes sense to you. And I say that um, there's one thing that, uh, you know, when you use the word moral, and you use that word moral in America, that word is directly connected to the Pilgrim Fathers. It's connected to the Judeo-Christian tradition. There's no getting around that. If you bring in another kind of moral, then you're, you're with the liberals. You know, they think that, they, think that uh, uh, they can correct everything that's happened in the past. See, they, they're, they're, they're romantics also. Uh, they, they think it's a wonderful thing to, to uh, give back everything that the white man took. You see, that white man that liberal white man thinks he's the better white man. Oh, that, was, that was described in, in, a, in a speech yesterday. Um, well, it will come down to this. Do you want freedom or not? Freedom costs blood. That's the fact. That's the law of, of human nature. If you want that you have to pay a price. And if you turn around and give it away, you're not gonna have it. It's, it's not the option that you're playing with there is horrible. What you have now that was bought with blood, that was bought with, by fighting Indians, uh, that's going to be taken. When, when you give that away, the replacement is not a different kind of freedom. You don't, you, you don't replace freedom with freedom. Freedom is replaced by oppression, by, by dominance, by, by uh, horrible things. So uh, you, you, have to, you have to be willing to, uh, again, I, I accuse myself of rank heathenism here. Uh, I, I don't think it's a matter of, of moral, that, that's a tactic. To, to, to use a moral justification, that is a political communicative tactic. And it may be very useful, but I'm saying in the end, uh, just take what you have the strength to take and keep it. Thank you. So we'll take uh, maybe a couple of, couple of questions here. Um, I, I want, oh, thank you. I want to get to your perspective as, uh, as an Indian on the idea of uh, uh, reconquista in the Southwest. Like Mexicans think, like Raz and Mecha thinks the Southwest belongs to them as Mexicans and it was stolen by us whites. Uh, as an Indian, what is your perspective on that? And, and as, do you think the reason we're so paralyzed and letting it happen right now is something to do with our, our fear of whiteness? Well, look. Uh, I think those, anybody that claims a right to something is basically a coward. You understand me? Mm -hmm. You know, the only people that have the rights are the people that have the strength. That's just the way it is. It's not right or wrong. It's just the way it is. Okay? Uh, Mexico was America's first girlfriend. Americans are in love. That is the most romantic country in the Western Hemisphere. He's in love with her. He's always been in love with her. Kept the cowboys uh, out there on the, on the prairie. Now she's fat and pregnant and wants to move in. <laughs> <laughs> you have to decide. You have to decide, is that my kid? 
And if it isn't, you got to kick her out. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I found it very interesting when you said that perhaps it wasn't uh, really in the best interest of the whites to unite. And I just have to think about three times when Western civilization was in peril. The first one at Salamis, the Athenian Navy defeated the Persians without the help of the Spartans. The Spartans, for some reason, uh, were lacking. Then Charles Martel, later on, the Moslems invaded. He acted alone. He didn't have the backing of all of Europe. Then finally, the last great Muslim threat, the Battle of Lepanto, they, the uh, Muslim fleet was defeated by the Venetian Navy, not the combined Navy of Europe. And in fact, the European Union has proven rather feckless. The Europeans seem to do much better when they're operating on their own. I thought that was a good observation you made. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I agree. I don't really have a question, but I have a comment or a, on the first question. To, and I wanted to clear something up. The Mexicans claim that they own the Southwest, including Texas, uh, but that's false. The people who controlled Texas when the Anglo settlers arrived, the vast bulk of Texas were the Comanches. Amen. It took the Anglo settlers six months to defeat the Mexicans in the Texas Revolution, 1835-1836. It took the combined forces of all the Anglo settlers and the U.S. Army 50 years to defeat the Comanches. So when the Mexicans say that we stole Texas from them, uh, they're just flat out wrong because they never owned it. They just claimed it.